Hello, church. Congratulations, you made it on time on Time Change Sunday, huh? <laughs> Miracles. Look at the person next to you. You look miraculous to me. <laughs> now, we need an agreement because in about 35 or 40 minutes, there's going to be some people begin to drift in. <laughs> and just keep looking forward. Don't say anything. Don't smirk. <laughs> Don't refuse to move. They're going to join us online. I'm going to try to remember in about a few minutes to, I'll tweak them a little bit too, just to encourage them in the love of Jesus and all of those things. <laughs> it's good to be with God's people. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the changes that we have kept since COVID was introduced was our offertory prayer. Uh, we changed some things about how we received offerings, but we have come to depend upon the corporate prayers of God's people in a new way. Uh, I believe the collective prayers of God's people can change the course of nations. And uh, for the most part, we were asleep to that, I think, prior to COVID. We used prayer as kind of a transitionary thing. We were moving from one portion of a service to another, or it was the sign that we were done and you could run to the restaurant. But I don't think we really imagined that, that prayer had a place of significance until we felt that our lives were threatened. And all of a sudden, prayer began to gain some new attention in our lives. And we don't want to give that up. The, one of the greatest privileges we have is joining together in a public place and praying to our God. And so we, we've tried to be far more strategic with that. Uh, I want to ask you this morning, our teenagers are actually on a retreat this weekend. So we want to pray for the adults that are with them. <laughs> No, but in a, in a broader way, we, we certainly want to pray for those students, but I want to pray for the young people in our nation. You know, throughout history, revolutions are often ignited in the hearts of young people because those who are trying to sow discord and anarchy understand there's an openness there that is difficult to find as you turn the calendar a few more times. But in the same way through history, renewals typically have begun in the hearts of young people. Uh, when Jesus was recruiting disciples, he recruited young people and gave them a life assignment. And I believe the Spirit of God is searching the earth today for young people. And I think our prayers can make an enormous difference in that. We've seen some expressions of that lately at Asbury. Um, the Jesus Revolution film has been released reminding us of how God has done that in the past in some ways. And if we would be so fortunate that the Spirit of God would move in the hearts of young people in our nation, in our world, what a privilege it would be to be able to be a part of that with our prayers. Amen? Amen. Amen. In fact, I can't think of any greater gift we could give to them. So I'm going to ask you for our offertory prayer today. If you'll join me for that, we'll start with our teenagers because they have faces and names on them. But we want to extend that then to young people across our community, our nation, the world. Why don't you stand for that? If you're joining us at home, you can stand as well. Put down your bagels, and your, your cinnamon rolls, your protein bars. I'm going to pray till your coffee gets cold. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for this day, for the great honor of gathering together. I thank you for your people in the earth. Lord, they are precious to you. And we stand in your presence this morning to lift before you the young people of our congregation, of our community, of this generation. Lord, there are spiritual forces arrayed against them that stand in opposition to them. And we ask this morning that you would pour out your spirit upon their lives. Give them understanding hearts far beyond their years. Give them discernment beyond their experience. May they have eyes to see and ears to hear the truth of a living God. We lift them before you today. Lord, we thank you for their lives, for their openness to you, for the sincerity with which they, they learn and will follow you. I thank you for a breakthrough that will move from community to community and town to town and city to city, college campus to college campus, school to school. Lord, we thank you for it. We praise you for it, that we will stand with our eyes and rejoice at the transformation in the hearts of that generation. We give you glory today. Lord, I pray for the parents that they'll have the courage to speak the truth. 
that they won't yield to the spirit of the world, but they'll be willing to be an authority and a voice for good and truth and uprightness and purity and holiness in the lives of their children. We praise you for it, and we thank you in advance for all that you will do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You may have a seat. campaign is the Sanctuary of Scripture, and we're uh, very excited to see what the Lord is going to do in this campaign. We're very excited about a new campaign that I'm especially excited about because I feel like it's an extension of what we all need to be doing to share in our community and our nation for visitors to come, and um, I'm ex very excited about it. When we see them unloading heavy equipment here to start our new project, I'm going to be very excited. I'm going to want to come and walk over the ground and see the beginning when it starts. And then I'm going to want to see it at different phases till we get to the completion. I have seen over many campaigns how much it opens up doors for others to come to know the Lord. And that's the most important thing. sharing some videos with you these past few weeks, giving you some glimpses of the church along our journey. Uh, we began as a church on Easter Sunday, 1980, and there have been many versions of World Outreach Church. Same story, same scripture, same commitment to the fundamentals, same desire to see people become fully devoted followers of Jesus, but it's looked very different through the iterations in the years. And wherever you arrive at anything, whether it's a church or a community or a school or a family system, you tend to think it's always been that way. And it's important to understand that we're on a journey, that we haven't reached a destination. We're not complete yet. Our story isn't fully written. We're not done. What's driven so much of the change through the years was the awareness of the unchurched communities around us and the significant percentage of the population that were not engaged in churches even though we live in a part of the country where that's presumed to be the normal. I can tell you today, the percentage of Rutherford County that does not participate in church is the highest it's ever been. A lot of reasons for that, community growth. Um, but if, if you just look around our community at the new houses that are being built, the new apartments that are being built, the new businesses that are being built, it's very obvious that churches are not keeping up. So even if the people wanted to attend, we lack the space. And so while you may have found the church in the last few years, it's been 15 years since we expanded our buildings. So that many of you have been here and thought we've just always looked like this. We haven't. Uh, we were young once. <laughs> long, long ago and far, far away. But God has been very, very faithful to us. And we are determined to be faithful to him. If you're a guest or you're visiting with us this weekend, and in many respects, this is not just a typical week weekend for us. It's the culmination of a capital campaign. It's commitment week for us. Uh, we started last night. It'll continue today and through Wednesday. Uh, we are excited. God has put before us an invitation for yet a new chapter. And uh, we are going to expand our capacity to serve our congregation, our community, and beyond. 
And we are honored that God would entrust us with such a thing. And if you're a visitor with us today, it's a little different kind of a service for us, but we're glad you're here because it really is the heart of who we are as a congregation. We're willing to change and grow and be different in order to serve God's people. We don't intend to maintain the status quo. We don't intend just to be protectors of a tradition. We intend to lift up the name of Jesus in this generation in a way that will make a difference for the generations to come. Amen. Amen. You should have received an outline when you came in. It's going to have most of the scriptures we will use there. I've been doing a series on determined faith. I believe that's what's necessary. We've had kind of passive faith. We've had church attender faith. We've had faith to be born again or converted. I believe in that. But that is the entry point to a spiritual life. It's not the conclusion. And if you have been trained or coached that once you're born again, you can sit on your good intentions and wait for the trumpet to blow, you've been deceived. I don't want to in any way diminish the reality or your commitment to that new birth. It's not that we're going to earn it or build upon it, but our response to the gift of salvation is what we do with our lives. The value we attach to that great expression of mercy and grace towards us is demonstrated in how we choose to live our lives, honoring the Lord. And we want to grow up in Him. I want to start in Revelation 22. It's very near the end of the book. It's a passage that honestly I wouldn't expect to find in our Bibles. Does the Bible ever surprise you? If you've read it very much, I, I suspect it has. Sometimes I'm just amazed at what God says. And in this passage in Revelation 22, it describes a time of tremendous contrasts. It feels very much like it was a response to the headlines of today. It says, then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong, and let him who is vile continue to be vile. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like counsel I would expect to find in the Scripture. If you want to be vile, be more vile still. If wickedness is your thing, be as wicked as you know how to be. Wow. Look at the next sentence. Let him who does right continue to do right, and let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Unusual counsel, I would submit, consistent with the book of Revelation and the messages to the churches at the beginning of the book. Jesus said to a church who was lukewarm, I would prefer that you were hot or cold, but since you're neither, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And it gets to the end of the book of Revelation, and he says, listen, decide where you stand. Make a decision. I would submit to you that a part of what we're doing as a congregation in these weeks is getting ready for next. I like it. I think it's an important part of the healthy life cycle of a congregation. We tend to become dormant. We tend to imagine that we have made decisions on all the important things, and there's nothing really significant yet for us to do, and we fall into routines that are kind of polite and convenient and comfortable. Folks, serving God is not comfortable. I don't believe it was ever intended to be. We are finite creatures and we worship an infinite God and we live in a world where there's a tremendous spiritual conflict taking place. I, I think it's a wrong imagination to assume that serving God is about comfort and convenience. We are witnesses to a tremendous shift taking place in our world. And it's not political or primarily even ideological. It is fundamentally a spiritual shift. There is a battle that has broken into the open, a deep darkness contending for the hearts and souls of men and women. And in contrast to that, there is a great light, but we have to decide where we will stand and what authority will rule and reign in our lives. I would humbly submit to you that the time for sitting on the fence is concluded. Even if you prefer a neutral posture, even if your personality or your life circumstance suggests it would be better for you to be able to whistle Dixie or the Battle Hymn of the Republic with equal enthusiasm, we've done that enough. To say or do nothing is a choice. Silence is affirmation. On the positive note, I would submit to you that God has chosen us for this unique season. 
He looked across the span of human history and he saw the, 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 the season in which we're living and he called your name and mine. What an honor. I didn't get to ride with Paul Revere through the streets of Boston. I didn't get called from a, a fishing boat on the shores of Galilee. God called our name in the 21st century. We have a kingdom assignment. I talked to you a bit lately about the theater of the absurd. They are continuing to sponsor performances. Have you noticed? The list is too long to recount anywhere near its entirety, but I brought a couple of episodes that I thought were noteworthy. We celebrated National Woman's Day this week. We did. Not a bad thing. Happy to have the celebration. I was a bit surprised to find that the Woman of Courage Award was presented by our first lady to a biological male. You can't make that up. The only thing that was missing was the little boy to say that the emperor has no clothes. No, no. It's just an indicator of uh, culturally the degree to which delusion and confusion is rampant amongst us. On, on a more unsettling note, you may or may not have read that an Arizona school board voted to stop allowing student teachers from a local Christian university. They had a five-year contract to allow the, the teachers who were in training to student teach in the public school system. Not unusual, not surprising. What was surprising that the school board voted to break the contract. And it was done because the, the school board members came forward with the idea that the children, the students, could not be safe in the school district if they were subjected to teachers who were being trained as Christians because the Christian school had on their website a desire to honor Jesus of Nazareth. And so the school board said that was a threat to the children in the schools. The rest of the story was equally insightful. The school board member who identified the Christian students as dangerous described themselves in this way on the website. This isn't something someone else said. This was a self-description. She described herself as the, on the district's website as a bilingual, disabled, neurodivergent, queer black Latina who loves a good hot wing, but only with the right ranch and things that sparkle. She also identified in this way, she also frequently wears cat ears. The description of the person is secondary to the idea being pushed into the public arena that if you hold a Christian worldview, you're dangerous to children. I object. Amen. It is the theater of the absurd. I don't want you to be angry. I don't want you to behave in a belligerent way. I certainly don't want you to be violent, but I want you to pay attention. I, I've lived in Israel enough and been in and out of that nation enough. I have learned something that if your adversary tells you what they intend to do, you had better believe them. And when they're pushing into the public square and acting on it, that Christians are a threat to the well-being of our children, you need to understand that that idea is gaining momentum around us and we had better use our voices. We have tried tolerance, we've tried being passive, we've tried looking the other way, we've tried saying Jesus isn't really that unique. We have compromised away our integrity until the churches are almost apostate. And we're going to have to begin with the humility on our knees to repent. It's an important time for the church. I would submit to you we've lost a great deal of our vision. We've settled for playing church and styles of church. and musical styles and personal taste and architectural distinctions. And we debate which translation we will read and how much of the Bible we will actually believe. Folks, if you are whiting out portions of your Bible, don't be confused. You're not a Christ follower. You can't pick and choose commandment one, two, and seven. You can't read Matthew and Luke, but skip Deuteronomy. We're in a very pivotal season for the people of God and the earth, and there's a lot of confusing voices washing over us. Our vision is important. What we see before us and how we understand it 
Not just what we see with our eyes, our physical eyes, and our, our physical senses, but what we perceive spiritually about the world around us. We have been stumbling in the dark, refusing to look, disinterested in listening. We'll support universities that advocate for the most ungodly things. Why do we do that? Why will we stand in the public square and cheer for them while they promote wickedness and ungodliness and immorality? How can that be? Look in John chapter 8, verse 56. This was Jesus speaking. It's one of the most intriguing vision statements in the Bible to me. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it, and he was glad. Now, you meet Jesus, you and I meet Jesus post-incarnation in the Gospels. If you remember, we meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. There's a lot of pages between Genesis 12 and Matthew 1. There's a lot of years, a lot of centuries, a whole lot of time, and Jesus said that Abraham saw my day. Abraham had an insight and understanding beyond what he could see with his physical eyes. We need that. It was the motivation for his life changes. It was the motivation for his decisions. It's what enabled him to pack up and leave a, a family in a circumstance. Jewish tradition tells us that Abraham belonged to the, the wealthiest idol maker of the region. And God said to him, I want you to leave. And Abraham loaded the van and left because he could see something that those around him couldn't see. Look at Hebrews 11 and verse 13. It said, all these people were still living by faith when they died. And they didn't receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Some of you will remember that Hebrews 11 is the hall of fame of faith in our Bible. It's the recounting of these most remarkable men and women. And the author of Hebrews says that they were all living by faith when they died. They were making choices based upon what they anticipated, something they could see with their faith that they had not yet experienced. How have we fallen so far away from that? How have we descended into a gospel of the immediate? That it gives me what I want, when I want it, the way I want it. And if it doesn't, I will withdraw from God or threaten to, to suggest that he isn't good or fair or just. Folks, we have a Bible filled with characters and illustrations and text to remind us to make our choices through time based on eternity. We do funerals on a weekly basis around here. It's not a rare occasion. And I've been in the same place for a good while, so many of those people I have done a lot of life with. And I can tell you that for those people, the end of life is triumphant. The circumstances of death can often be disappointing. The failure of our physical body is, is not something to celebrate. But the anticipation of what we have lived our lives for in time is absolutely something to celebrate. We grieve with family and friends for the loss, for the breach of a relationship, for the diminishment that that brings to the journey. But we celebrate for the people that step with their faith into eternity. Are you making decisions that way? Do you have that vision tucked in your heart? Please don't lead your life like the secularist around you. Don't allow their values to be your values, their aspirations to be your aspirations. Please don't help your children imagine a future that is secular, except that once in a while they sit in a church building and say, Jesus. Help them imagine a different kind of life, a different ordering of their priorities, a different set of goals, a different set of behaviors, a distinctiveness that comes from honoring God in our lives. Hmm. You know, some people look around and see what's taking place and they say, why? Why is this happening? But there are others that have a God perspective and they look around the eyes of faith, and they say, why not? Why not? Why can't we take prayer back into our schools? Why not? Why can't Jesus be honored on our college campuses again? Why shouldn't the Christian faith be a part of the corporate boardroom again? 
Why should we not imagine and expect and anticipate that our hospital corridors and our courtrooms and the halls of our state capitals and the halls of Congress and the Supreme Court would be filled with men and women who fear the name of the Lord? We don't want a state religion. We're not advocates for a state religion, but neither will we tolerate the state infringing on the free exercise of our religion. It takes courage to lead. You know, there's all kinds of books. There's whole sections now in bookstores on leadership. Lots of chatter about it. At the end of the day, leadership is influence. The influence of your life. It's not about a title or a plaque or a position or your station in an org chart. We've all known people that had a title or a place in an org chart and people could have cared less what they thought. We elect those people. But to truly use the influence of your life for the kingdom of God takes courage. We haven't talked about this a great deal. We've imagined that we had to get our theology just exact. We spent enormous effort learning to spell the 12 tribes of Israel in Hebrew letters. And I'm all for learning. I've given my life to it. I don't want to, get, I would encourage you to get all the education you can afford. And after that, to keep learning. But we haven't talked as much about the necessity of leading with courage. To use your faith and the influence of your life for the kingdom of God. Don't go to the ball fields and just cheer for your children and grandchildren. Go to the ball fields and sit in the bleachers as an ambassador for the kingdom of God. Don't sit there and tolerate wickedness. Don't sit there silently and listen to ungodliness. Don't go to business. Don't go to work and leave your faith at home. Don't go to school and leave your faith at home. People won't like it. No kidding. Let's just get it on the table. Everybody's not going to like it. Somebody will object. It'll be okay. You don't have to be angry. You don't need to be belligerent. But you can, if you're waiting for everybody to agree with you, you'll spend all your life I brought you an example. He's one of my heroes in the Bible. His name is Nehemiah. There's a book that bears his name. It's a little longer passage than I would typically read, but I think it's worth it this morning. It says, these are the words of Nehemiah, the son of somebody. Well, I mean, who could pronounce that name? In the month of Kislev in the 20th year, while I was in the city of Susa, Hananiah, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. Nehemiah lives in Persia. And a visitor comes through the capital from Jerusalem. And Nehemiah interviews him. He wants to know the, con the, the condition of Jerusalem. And he says, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. And the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept for some days. I mourned and fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, and he gives us his prayer. It's worth reading. He said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night. For your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. Please note the, the way Nehemiah aligns himself with the godless. He's not pointing an accusing finger. He's saying we're guilty. We have behaved in ungodly ways and we have stood in the midst of ungodliness. And I acknowledge it to you, folks. We've pointed our fingers long enough. We've got to put our faces on the floor and say, God, be merciful to us. If we have been called to be salt and light, we have failed in our assignments. The corruption is growing and mounting around us. But Nehemiah prays on. He said, I confess the sins we Israelites, myself and my father's house have committed. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws which you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. 
But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the furthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. And that next sentence is the key to unlocking that chapter. He said, I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah has a very important job in the ancient Near East. And a, a monarch was an absolute authority. There were no checks and balances. There was no court of appeals. And they were often assassinated, removed from power, wherever there was a power struggle. And one of the most frequent ways of eliminating someone in a position of power was to poison them. So the person who tasted your food needed to be someone you trusted. And Nehemiah is the trusted cupbearer to the king. And when he sees the condition, when he hears of the condition of Jerusalem and his people, he begins to seek God in fasting and praying and sacrifice. And then we read his prayer. He acknowledges his sin and reminds God that what he, of what he knows from the word of God. You see, the, the authority, the platform which, from which Nehemiah is responding is the authority of Scripture. When we pray for our generation, we don't pray based on our wishes or just our preferences or our good ideas. We come to God based on the authority of his word. We have seen the benefits of this. The civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s that brought so many wonderful changes to our nation was founded on biblical authority. It was not a political movement or an ideological movement. It was an expression of authority from the Word of God that said we all have the, we are all equal in the sight of Almighty God. We have drifted a long way away from those moral points of authority in our society. I would submit to you, we can trust God's Word in the same way that Nehemiah did. We have been co-opted by secularism. We're waiting for election results or judicial rulings or school board changes. And while I look forward to all of those things, I believe they will follow spiritual changes. It's time that we honor God once again. Amen. Nehemiah goes to the king and he says, I need a leave of absence. I'd like to go back to Jerusalem and see the walls rebuilt around that city, its defenses restored, its people protected. I would like permission to leave your service, and I would like the resources I will need to accomplish the task. And I would like letters of protection from you to see that I receive safe passage and I'm honored when I get there. It's not a light lift. You know a little bit about the dynamic from the book of Esther. Esther was hesitant to go to the king with a request. She said, if I approach the king and I'm not welcomed, I'll lose my life. So Nehemiah just slips it in at the last. I was cupbearer to the king. He's going to lead with his faith. He could have organized a prayer meeting, a small group. He could have gathered the people that remembered Jerusalem to fast and pray with him. He could have done many things that would have covered his lack of activity, but he had the courage to lead. He had the courage to use the influence he had been entrusted with. We desperately need that in our generation. We've got to stop arguing about secondary things. We've got to stop introducing division about things. Listen, folks, if we can disagree on a point and we can both go to heaven, I will extend to you the hand of fellowship. We've got to grow up a little bit. The courage to lead. I think we also have to acknowledge the cost of leadership. It's not cheap. It's the reason we haven't done it. It's not that we weren't aware of the need. It wasn't that we didn't even recognize some opportunities. We were intuitive enough or perhaps well briefed enough to understand there's a cost to using your Christian influence. If you step into the public square and say, it doesn't look to me like they're following the science, you'll be mocked. There's many things you can say. If you step into the public square and say, I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. 
I believe that the authority for children should reside with their parents before it does with the, the teachers' unions or the counselors at school or the government. We understand there are many places where we have the wisdom and the life experience to lead with our faith, but there's a cost to it. Look at Hebrews 11. It's a little commentary on Moses' life, one of the greatest leaders in all of Scripture. It says, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. There's a series of decisions Moses has made that are highlighted here. He refused to be known as Pharaoh's daughter, the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to identify with the people of God. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ. That's a bizarre sentence. Christ is the English equivalent of the Greek word Christos, which is the equivalent of the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is Messiah. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Messiah. Wait a minute, Moses is in the book of Exodus. Born into slavery in Egypt. And the author of Hebrews tells us that when he stood up to Pharaoh and identified with the Hebrew people, the, the Hebrew slaves, he understood himself to be accepting disgrace for the sake of Christ. He understood his faith to be, on, be beyond the moment, to be beyond the generation. It was about something more important than his address. That's a staggering statement. It's worth meditating a little bit on. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. He was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn wouldn't touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. Moses' choices, there's seven that are listed there. I'm not going to belabor them, but I'll tag them. He refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. There's some things you're going to have to refuse. You've been accepting some things you shouldn't. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. There will be a cost to leading with your faith. Okay. It's all right. There's a reward for it that far exceeds the cost. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of more value than the treasures of Egypt. He lived in the palace. He had access to the treasures of Egypt. He said, I'd rather be identified with the slaves than live in the palace. He was not an equity warrior. He was looking ahead to his reward. He left. He walked away from a great deal. He persevered. Perseverance is a necessity. He saw him who was invisible. That's another intriguing statement. How do you see something that's invisible? Well, you don't see it with your physical eyes. And finally, it says he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood. It's the outcomes that I think are most intriguing about Moses' leadership. He paid a price, but the outcomes are truly dramatic. It says that he helped the people pass through the Red Sea. That part you know. Through Moses' leadership, God made a way that was impossible. And they saw their enemies annihilated. But the author of Hebrews says something else. The pattern of chapter 11 is that it gives you the name of a leader, and then it begins to recite the outcomes of their lives. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Moses. By faith, Noah. And when it's telling the Moses story, it says that the Red Sea parted, but it also says something else. Did you catch it? It says that the walls of Jericho fell. Well, in case you don't remember your chronology, Moses is dead before they get to Jericho. He's buried by God on the other side of the Jordan River. They cross the Jordan, and then the first city that they, they encounter is Jericho. But the author of Hebrews puts the Jericho victory in Moses' resume. I believe that Moses' faith, his leadership, his choices, his influence contributed to the walls of Jericho falling. 
I believe the author of Hebrews is implying something to us that Moses' leadership made it possible for a new generation to have a victory. That's Joshua's first real challenge. I mean, the, the Jordan River was backed up, but the, the first real adversarial relationship was with Jericho. And the author of Hebrews is saying, Moses' fingerprints are all over that. I believe that's a part of what we're doing as a community of faith. We're making choices not just for ourselves, not just for the comfort and convenience of our lives, but we're considering sacrifices and investing in the possibilities for a whole new generation. I believe we have to live with that kind of faith. I want to wrap this up with a little segment on the joy of giving. It's not something I've talked about as much as I should have since COVID. It seems like there's been other issues on the tables before us. But how we process generosity of our time and our talent and our resources is a very, it's an, it's an, you can't separate your faith from that. And there's some wonderful lessons we've looked at as we've walked through this season. In Mark chapter 12 is the familiar passage of Jesus on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And he's watching the people bring their offerings. And people are making gifts of tremendous value. And he recognizes that there's one, a widow who comes and puts in two small copper coins, a pittance, an amount that's easily overlooked. And Jesus gathers the disciples to him, his closest friends, the ones that he is tutoring in private. And he said, did you see that? That woman put in more than all the rest of these people. And the disciples are a bit confused. Maybe Jesus has been in the sun too long, a little dehydrated. He said, no, there were some big gifts put in today. And he said, yes, they gave from their abundance, but she gave all that she had. And Jesus is introducing us to an idea. We evaluate our gifts by how much we give. God evaluates them by how much we retain. You see, that woman gave her reserve. It's an amazing thing to think about. She gave her reserve. And Jesus called the disciples' attention to it. I'm always concerned when we come to this point in these journeys together as a church. We set our objectives and our goals, and they're intimidating. They always have been. Because at every step when we've, we've come to these points as a congregation, we're moving forward, and, and next always looks intimidating. In the rearview mirror, it doesn't look so intimidating, but you're the one standing there in the moment. It does. And, and the group of people that I, I always have the most compassion for are the people whose budgets are the tightest who don't have great resources to give. Because the temptation is to say, well, you know, the, the, the contribution I can make isn't going to make a difference. The goal is $30 million, and it's a sacrifice if I give 20. I'd have to reorder my life to make $20 a month available, and what difference would that make? Well, based on Jesus' comments, it makes all the difference for you. It wasn't that the treasury was going to be moved, the needle wasn't going to be moved by the woman's sacrifice, but the kingdom of heaven was moved. And the point of these seasons for us as a congregation, the, the resources is secondary to the, the unity of purpose around a vision to be a vibrant, vital, transformational church. We're not here for our convenience and comfort. That's not why we gather every week. It doesn't offend us if it's comfortable, and we're not bothered if it's inconvenient, but that's not the idol that we will worship. We will endure discomfort and inconvenience. I watched you sit in the rain, in the heat, in the cold, in the humidity, for the privilege of gathering with God's people. I watched you gather when there were voices that said it might not be safe, and other people talking to you saying, I wouldn't do that. And I watched you sit outside. We understand that. Sacrifice is a very personal decision. I can't decide what that would look like for you any more than you can decide what that would look like for me. God will evaluate. Only he can judge the thoughts of intents of our heart. Don't spend your time trying to figure out what somebody else should do. That's kind of our default reaction. Well, this wouldn't be a problem if the rich people would do their part. I trust their heart in the Lord. Amen. Don't give in to the cultural motivation to hate people who are more affluent than you are. That's wicked. The assumption they did something wrong or evil or inappropriate is the wrong assumption. 
Thank God for people who are blessed in a way you haven't been yet. Amen? Uh, That is one of the most divisive, destructive ideas. And I disrespect people who gain leadership trying to pit us against one another. It's a wicked thing to do. We're not all going to be able to make equal gifts. But we can all make equal sacrifices. And I trust the Lord to work that out. We've talked about it a great deal. $30 million is a big number, but it's not a big number to God. It does not cause God to lose his breath. (gasps) People say to me frequently, am I concerned that the church is too large? No, I'm embarrassed. There's so few of us. I am. Look at 2 Samuel 24. I've got to wrap this up. I know. It's a story from the life of David. David's made a mistake, and the judgment of God is moving. David's responding, and he wants to offer a sacrifice. So he needs to purchase a place to do that. And he goes to purchase a threshing floor. It's a, it's a piece of bare rock. It's a perfect place for a sacrifice. It's Mount Moriah, if you know your Bible, where by Jewish tradition, it's where Abraham took Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. And David goes to Arun and says, I want to build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. And Arun has said to David, let my Lord the king take whatever he pleases and offer it up. Smart man, because David has a habit of taking whatever he pleases. And he doesn't want to get between David and what he wants. You can have everything. You can have the oxen for the offering. You can have the threshing sledges and the oaks for the wood. It's an all-inclusive package, my gift to the king. But David said to him, I insist on paying for it. I'll not sacrifice to the Lord God my burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So he paid for the threshing floor and the oxen. David invites us to another principle, that we don't just give to God those things that don't matter to us. We don't just give him the inconsequential. That's not an offering. That's cleaning house. God is not our goodwill box. We don't give him what's worn out, what we don't want, what's out of fashion, what's out of style. It's dishonoring. In the same way God said, don't bring me an animal sacrifice that is has a defect. Don't use the sacrifices to cull the herd. He said, bring me the animals that are the most valuable. And that's a principle in our lives. It's why the first tenth belongs to the Lord. Not whatever's left. We learn to honor God with our time, with our resources, with our talent. It will change the trajectory of your life. And whenever we do it collectively, it changes the trajectory of our congregation. But it's not intuitive, and it's not easy, and it is certainly countercultural. One last passage, and I'll stop. It's Moses and this this group of slaves. They're free now. They're on the other side of the, the Red Sea. God has shown Moses the tabernacle. He showed him the heavenly tabernacle and says, reproduce one of those. So Moses goes to the people and explains what he's seen. And he said, we're going to need the resources to do this. And he asks the people to give, and he recruits the craftsmen to do the work. It's what's in your notes. It said they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. The people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. All the skilled craftsmen who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left their work and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses gave an order, and they sent the word throughout the camp, no man or woman is to make anything else as an offering to the sanctuary. And the people were restrained from bringing more. Stop, he said. Too much. It's in the book. They weren't perfect people. The next month there's a complaint line so long that the earth opens up and swallows a few of them. It's not that they're perfect people. God is working something into them. What I think is important for us to note that has relevance for you and me, these are the former slaves of Egypt giving for the tabernacle. They plundered the nation of Egypt when they left, but they're still in the wilderness. They haven't occupied the promised land yet. No businesses, no homes, no vineyards, no plowed fields, no schools for their kids. They have no way to replenish their gifts. 
They are giving their reserves. It's a sacrifice they're making that is supported by gratitude. This is where we were, and this is the freedom that we know. Our future is not clear. It's uncertain. The people that occupy the land are intimidating. It's an expression of trust in the God who delivered. They weren't living lives of stored abundance. They're getting daily provisions, manna every day. And when they try to get two days, it spoils. God says, no, you'll have to trust me. And now they're given an opportunity to give, and they don't give from their stored abundance. They give sacrificially. It's amazing to me. I read it like it's normal, but it's bizarre. Their giving was an expression of trust. So is yours, and so is mine. For the overwhelming majority of us, it's an expression of trust in God. We live in an uncertain season. The economy's nuts, have you noticed? Folks, you can't secure your future. One of my most trusted friends came to me the last time we did a building expansion. A few weeks after we signed the construction contracts, the economy collapsed. It was awful. My friend came up to me quietly at church one weekend and he said, Alan, if my friends and I had just given what we've lost in the last few months, we'd have paid cash for the buildings. You see, we can't secure our futures. Only God can do that. We're learning to trust Him. We look for ways to give expression to that. That's why we're here this weekend. Some of you have heard me tell the story years ago when the church was small. We felt like the Lord put it in our heart to, to reach our community with the gospel. And so we, we'd been here long enough. We had a building built, and we really thought that was our goal. And the Lord made us uncomfortable with that. And so we said that by Easter of 2000, we wanted to see 2,000 people come to worship for Easter Sunday. We had about 150 people in the church. I could not envision 2,000 people coming to campus for anything. I couldn't. I didn't think free food, $1,000 bills for our guests, <laughs> the Hooters girls taking up the Easter offering. I could not think of something. We did not do that, just for the record. <laughs> but I could not envision that. It was beyond me. I didn't have a heart for it. I didn't have confidence for it. What I could do is say, well, perhaps we could make a 20% increase in participation next year. That meant about 30 people over the next 12 months. I thought, now, I could believe God for 30 people. And I did the math on, yeah, if we did that for five or six years, we might hit that target for Easter because Easter attendance is different. And, and I remember when I stood up and said to the church, this is what we're going to do. My friends laughed, and not with joy. It was beyond us, but it became an assignment, and we began to pray about it and fast and pray about it and have nights of prayer about it. And I was in my car one day. I'd run across town for something. I remember where I was parked. I remember the traffic light I was sitting at, and I was praying for those 2,000 people. And I heard the Lord say something to me. Now, I'm sure it was a voice on the inside of me, but it was so real to me, I looked in the back seat. I thought maybe somebody put a speaker in the back seat of my car, and they were punking me. But the Lord said to me, why so few? Because that was as big as my imagination was. My faith wasn't that bad. It was just as big as my imagination was. Well, we had more than 2,000 people at Easter when we got to Easter 2000. But I learned a valuable lesson. Yeah, the, the church never to me was about attendance numbers again. We pay attention to that because it's a marker of whether the, the nurseries work or the bathrooms are clean, but I didn't put any more limits on that. Well, I like to walk and pray. When COVID happened, I spent weeks watching the sunrise while I prayed in the fields. And I've been back in the fields lately. And I was praying for us in this next step, and $30 million, it's a big number. I can't write that check. I can't closely approximate that. Well, I can, it just wouldn't be, it would be worthless and they would put me somewhere. <laughs> and I was talking to the Lord about it. And I had that same still voice inside of me say, why so small? And I thought, oh, geez. 25 years later, I got busted again. 
with an imagination that's too small, with faith that's too little. I think in terms of what I can do and what I'm capable of. Not in terms of God's heart for people. Not in terms of the season in which we're living and the necessity of telling the truth. So we can put whatever goals we want there. I believe we, we will see God in the years ahead do far more than we can imagine. We have decades now of a story to tell to support that kind of confidence in the Lord. And he will use us. He will. We'll rock more babies. Some of you will get to go on retreats with teenagers. <laughs> Better start to fast and pray. <laughs> but this weekend we're making commitments. When you came in, you got a commitment card. If you didn't, if you'll raise your hand, the ushers will bring you one. We'd like everyone at least to have one. You can make a decision to, to pass, but I'd rather you not just be mute on it. Somebody stopped me last night and said, Pastor, I, I've been in, they were newer to the church, but they said, I had the habit of being really still when these things happen. And they said, God stirred me this time, and I want to be a part. It's pretty simple. It's a place for you to make a commitment. You can give weekly, you can give monthly, you can give annually, you can give whatever fits the pattern and routine of your life. It's a three-year commitment. So it's not just about a gift today or next week. We're going to live with this for a bit because we're going to expand how we can serve our community. Um, some of you give online, and you can certainly do that. There's some boxes there you can check, so you can schedule giving, or you can even go to the website. You, you don't have to use the... The physical card you can give digitally. The flip side of the card gives you some numbers. It helps you imagine what that looks like as a weekly or a monthly commitment. If you're not a math genius and, and you, that little bit of a help is beneficial to you. What I want to ask you to do is take a few minutes and just prayerfully contemplate your involvement in this. We're going to show you a little video of some folks that have made the journey and some who are newer. And when the video is done, I'm going to give you some instructions about what's next. I would encourage you not just to predetermine what's easy or convenient or comfortable. Family in the church made a commitment a, a few weeks ago, a very significant commitment. It was a seven-figure gift. And they called this week, and we said we were talking about it, and the Lord really moved us. We want to raise that gift. So I said, well, please keep talking. Don't... <laughs> I, I am more than content for every one of us simply to ask the Lord how he would like us to involve, be involved. I trust him. It isn't the magnitude. You may be the person that brings the two small copper coins, and the Lord will point you out in all of heaven and say, that was spectacular. Don't take a pass because you feel insignificant. And don't give God a tip because you feel pressured. I don't want you to feel pressured. I want you to recognize an invitation. All right? They're going to play a video, and then I'm going to say a prayer. We'll make our commitments, and then we'll wrap this up pretty quickly, okay? Well, if I were talking to a family about whether to participate in this uh, campaign, the sanctuary of scripture. I would tell them how exciting it is, to, first of all, to be a part of something the Lord is doing. There's nothing so satisfying and you don't really know how it's gonna end or what he might do. He's, he's so amazing. If somebody wanted to say that the church shouldn't get any bigger, that we shouldn't reach out to more people, I would say you're absolutely wrong. It's such a privilege to open the church to more people, to bring people in that want to know Jesus and are desperate to know Him. And maybe they don't even know yet what their desperation, the answer to their desperation is. We want to change our culture. And if we can uh, uh, influence children and their parents towards uh, biblical principles, I'm excited about it and I want to be a part of it. And I want our children and grandchildren to have the opportunity to see what our heritage is as Christians, I am, I am so excited about it. It is so important as a, 
as followers that we stick together and stand firm in our faith and stand up because God will be there with us. And we just need to remember that he's with us. We need to stand firm, be faithful and go on, go forth with what he has for us. I think when, when something comes before me and I'm praying about it, I just ask God to use me in whatever way He can to expand what He's doing, whatever that is. I want to give the biggest part of me that I can to expand that. I would say to someone who's trying to decide if they want to participate is to go all in. I have seen over many campaigns, how much it opens up doors for others to come to know the Lord. I would never want to hinder anyone from having the opportunity to know the Lord. And if there is something that I can do, whether it's to sacrifice something each month to be able to give to the campaign, to be able to make this happen, I want to. And I've seen through the years how faithful the Lord is in different ways. And He blesses you for your faithfulness to Him. We're excited about investing in this project because it's a, just another way to extend an invitation to the community, to people who don't know the Lord, who um, who are just, they're willing to be here in a concert or to be outside if they're willing to be in the food trucks. Just a way, it's another option to invite people into the community. I would encourage people to give generously because you never know what blessing is gonna be on the other side of that. God will always bless you when you give generously. And that's what we try to do. And I would encourage you guys to do that too. If I could talk to my friends at the church, I would say that for my personal experience, Someone else made a big sacrifice so that my family could benefit, so that our family could be strengthened. That sacrifice has made all of the difference for our family and for our eternity. And so I would encourage you to pray and to ask the Lord where you can be faithful in supporting the next steps for the church. There is no such thing as free. Somebody paid for it, and that goes to all aspects of life. Uh, we came to the church in 2015, and all we knew was three crosses. We didn't know anything different. Um, not realizing the sacrifices that were put forward ahead of our time. Um, I think it's a good time to reflect Christ in this situation here and present your sacrifice to further the kingdom of God at this point. The Sanctuary of Scripture campaign, to me, I've, I've kind of been able to, as we've processed it together and as a family, I can sum it up with the word opportunity. So we have decided as a family that we, we want to take advantage of any opportunity God gives us to know Him better and to make Him known. And so this particular project, to me, allows families to do that in, in a culture that's uncertain and troubling at times. Our lives are overwhelming and can be messy. What a nice, uh, uh, more than nice, what a redeeming place this is already and will continue to be on a whole new level.
If I could speak to my best friends, I would say to them, invest in God's kingdom. It's the greatest investment a human being can ever make. And the results are so um, plentiful and fruitful in one's own life. Amen. Amen. We have we have been given great gifts, and I believe presented by the Lord with a great opportunity. And I want to thank you in advance for your generosity and your faithfulness, for the way you serve, the way you give, for the light that you hold up in this community and in our region and quite candidly in our nation. Uh, you are making a difference. So I want to invite you to stand with me. We're going to worship the Lord for just a minute. I want to give you a couple of instructions, and if you will, cooperate with me. I would like the privilege of having a prayer of commitment with you before we leave this morning. Okay, would you be willing to do that? Here's the, t here's the challenge. I'm going to ask you to bring your commitments forward. There are stations set up all over the room. You don't have to come all the way to the front. There are stations in the middle. There are stations at the back, whichever is the fewest steps. But then you can return to your, where you're standing now and remain standing while we worship. It's only going to take about three minutes. And then I would like to have a prayer of commitment with you, which means you'll have to turn down the volume on that little voice that says you need to be the first car out of the parking lot. <laughs> okay? If you'll do that with me, whichever sanctuary you're in, while you're worshiping the Lord and bringing your commitments forward, I'm going to step over and talk to the people on live stream. I'm not leaving. I'm not trying to get out of the parking lot ahead of you. But I would like the privilege of praying with you in about three minutes. Would you do that? It's one of those days that we'll look back on. There was too many of us today to anoint rocks with oil and to do some of the things that we have done historically, but that prayer is significant. So we're going to worship the Lord, and while you're worshiping, I uh, just invite you, at your leisure, we're not going to tee you up by rows. You bring those commitments, whether they're to the front or the middle or the back, whichever's closest for you. And then if you'll go back to where you're standing, in a couple of minutes, we're going to offer it to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Good morning, it's Pastor Allen. And uh, if you've been watching the stream, you know what's happening here on our campus right now in, in all of our sanctuaries, in Genesis and New Harvest and All Nations, Fellowship Square, here in Three Crosses, there's hundreds, thousands of people lined up making their commitments. Well, you're a part of our congregation. Many of you across Middle Tennessee and many of you far beyond Middle Tennessee regularly communicate with us that you receive ministry, you're fed by what God is doing here at World Outreach Church. And I didn't want to leave you out of today. We invite you to the communion table. We invite you to our prayers for healing. We invite you to our campus. I want to invite you to be a part of this initiative. We're going to make some changes to our campus, new roads, some new buildings, some new ways to gather with more people outside and serve the body of Christ, I believe, more effectively. And I want to ask you to consider making a sacrificial investment in that. If you've been a part of this church for a while, this is pretty simple. If you have given and God has blessed you, this is a simple, it's a simple question. If the Lord has blessed your faithfulness, why would you not participate? If it's a new idea to you, it's a step of faith. And I'm in the business of encouraging people to take steps of faith. You can give digitally, you can go to the website, you get the same pledge card, pledge form that the rest of us are using. It's a three year window of time. I want to prayerfully ask you to consider making an investment in what God is doing. It's not just a local church anymore. God is using our congregation to minister people across the Southeast, across the nation, and truly around the world. We're honored. I'm honored to stand with you and serve with you. And I want to thank you in advance for your participation. 
I'm gonna step back over here for a prayer of consecration, but join me for that. Wherever you are, you stand for this prayer. We're praying together that the purposes of God will be triumphant in this generation. Thank you for your faithfulness. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. What an honor to stand with you. It's an exciting day. I know it's kind of a sober time. We're making financial investments, but we're making a way for the Spirit of God to move. And it's not something one of us can do or some small handful of us can do. It takes all of us. The strength of our church through all of these years has not been three or four families, but it's been the, the majority of us in every season that would stand together and say, we believe God would do something yet again. And I thank you for being a part of this. Uh, in the months and the years ahead, we will see God's response. And somebody will walk up and ask you if you expected this. And I'm, with honesty, I always have to say, no, I really didn't. God always exceeds my expectation. But I sometimes feel the stretch between here and there. <laughs> Amen, Roman. I want to pray with you. Why don't you take hands with somebody near you? We don't have to make a circle. I just don't want you to be by yourself. All right, whichever sanctuary you're in, if you're joining us online, you just send us your name and where you're watching from. If you don't know the person you've got a hold of, introduce yourself. If they won't talk to you, turn loose of them. <laughs> they're rebellious, their prayer won't help anyway. A community of faith is one of the greatest honors of our life. We need one another. Those who stand in opposition to the purposes of God underestimate two things, our boss and our love for one another. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for the great honor of taking a step forward with you. I thank you that you love us enough and care for us enough to present us with an invitation to once again extend what you would do in our midst. We thank you for that great honor. I pray for every person today, every family, Lord, as they have responded to you in faith, I pray that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out upon their courage and confidence. Lord, you are the one who keeps us. Only you can secure our futures. And I thank you that you're a God who redeems, a God who delivers, a God who restores, a God who renews, that we will see in the season ahead of us the responses of Almighty God in the midst of our congregation. May be a light in our community and a light in our region and a light in our nation and a light for your people in the earth. We praise you for it, Lord. We recognize the great honor and the privilege. And we come this morning thanking you that you have entrusted to us with such an opportunity. And we praise you for your goodness and your faithfulness in the earth that we will see the name of Jesus exalted. For it's in his name we pray and we believe. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you.